Quais os benefícios das ações educativas e comunitárias para as orquestras e para a sociedade? No quinto episódio da série Gestão Cultural Mundo Afora, gestores de seis orquestras do Brasil e do Reino Unido relatam experiências educativas e explicam como tais ações estão relacionadas com o futuro das orquestras. Série Gestão Cultural Mundo Afora, mas uma troca de experiências sobre métodos e estratégias de gestão cultural está começando. We have three kind of main areas of, of our work. Um, one of them very much involves the orchestra, so that is uh, small ensemble performances for early years. Uh, the full orchestra giving schools performances in Symphony Hall um, and family concerts as well with the full orchestra in Symphony Hall. The next strand is working with, with schools and young people. So we deliver quite a lot of activity in schools, a lot of creative projects. So working with children to, to develop their own creativity alongside our own musicians. Um, but we also run um, activities for more gifted and talented young instrumentalists. Um, and also we have our youth orchestra, which works with very talented young people. Um, then the third area of our work is uh, kind of working with communities. So we currently have three community choirs, um, which are unauditioned, so anybody can, can join. One of those is for young people. Uh, and then our, our programme working with older people living with dementia, which we run in a, um, two care homes uh, here in Birmingham. So it's quite a varied programme. Here it started 30 years ago. In, in some senses, it's, um, it comes about because musicians uh, and, and arts organisations are despairing that the arts is being cut in the school curricula. Now only certain schools are teaching music and there aren't enough good music teachers which is why we're helping to train teachers to be, to be able to deliver, particularly in primary school level, um, a reasonable sort of music, basic music education. So I think that that's one impetus. I think the other, the other is to say that um, we want to make sure we've got an audience and we've got musicians in the future so we need to play a part in in you know in the education of young people the main focus of our activity is schools concerts which we do for each uh, grade in the school curriculum so we're currently covering four four different programs for four different age groups we also do three family concerts a year at royal festival hall um, which are led by, um, introduced by uh, a children's television presenter who is known to the children through his programs. We work um, in the community with um, disadvantaged people, um, sometimes um, also disabled, so music, music as a therapy. Education and young people have always been very much at the heart of what we've done with Aurora. I think, you know, for, for any for any orchestra uh, operating in classical music, um, certainly in the UK, I don't know how true this is in Brazil, but um, it's it's a huge challenge, I think, to make sure that your programme is accessible and relevant to young audiences and to, to society as a whole. To give you an example, I suppose the the, the the main focus of our work with young people uh, is our family concert series, Far, Far Away, which is a hugely successful and, and um, very popular storytelling-based um, concert series which aims to open up classical music for younger audiences.
sempre no, nos ensaios gerais a gente convidava a, a, a escolas, tanto de escolas particulares quanto escolas é, públicas, em, em comum acordo com a Secretaria de Educação, para que pudessem assistir a, a, ao ensaio geral. A gente chamava esse projeto de Sinfonia do Saber. A motivação maior para o desenvolvimento desse projeto, é, a priori, seria criar novos públicos, criar um acesso à, à, à Orquestra Sinfônica do Sergipe, fomentar a, a cultura no Estado. Né? Então, é claro que, que o fato de termos crianças, jovens e adolescentes assistindo aos concertos, assisti, assistindo ao, ao ensaio, no caso do Sinfonia do Saber, é, sem dúvida criava, aguçava a sua criatividade a sua, e a sua vontade de querer aprender um instrumento novo e conhecer um novo universo. A formação de novos públicos sempre foi, desde a criação da orquestra em 2008, um dos principais focos e um dos principais objetivos. A Filarmônica tem diversas séries de concertos justamente com esse objetivo. A primeira delas é o concerto, são os concertos para a juventude. É uma série de seis concertos, seis domingos pela manhã, no horário super acessível, com ingresso a cinco reais, então o preço também é muito acessível para as pessoas. Normalmente é um concerto onde o maestro interage com o público, de vez em quando uma pessoa sobe no palco, usamos solistas da própria orquestra, a programação é pensada de uma forma em que as pessoas também se identifiquem com o repertório e elas também possam conhecer outro repertório. Uma outra série de concertos de formação de plateia que temos é, são os concertos didáticos. Nós tocamos é, dois concertos pela manhã e dois à tarde nos dias de semana, nos horários de aula das crianças. Então nós fazemos quatro concertos didáticos por ano para escolas públicas, então com uh, o foco na educação mesmo para a formação de plateia de base dentro das escolas e isso como é, matéria extracurricular. A Orquestra Juvenil da Bahia é, digamos, a, a vitrine, é a locomotiva do Neogibá. Foi, desde o início, um, um planejamento estratégico se criar uma orquestra juvenil a mais é, forte, a mais consistente possível, para que essa orquestra forte conquistasse a simpatia, angariasse apoio, e formasse os multiplicadores. Então, se é a função vitrine, é, a, 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 conquistador de apoio na sociedade, é, um formação desses multiplicadores e motivador para quem está lá na ponta, para quem está se iniciando no subúrbio ou numa cidade que não, não tem grandes assistências de, em termos de educação musical. Diria que são essas as funções mais importantes da Juvenil da Bahia. We have a program um, uh, for graduates of conservatoires. Uh, we take uh, 16 musicians a year and mentor them. So one of each in instrument. We normally have about 300 applicants and we, we select the 16, the players select the 16 and they're mentored by a player within the orchestra, usually the principal in that section. And they give their own concerts and they also work with our Young Composers program which is led by a composer in residence. The future first came about when we realised that there was not really a need for a youth, a London Philharmonic Youth Orchestra anymore because the conservatoires had since established their own orchestras. But we did discover through the conservatoires that there was a real need for graduates to have some assistance going into the profession, which is why we established our Future First program. So we uh, run a project called Sparks, uh, which is an inspiration day where young musicians come and work alongside our players in master classes and small ensemble work. 
um, and, and that really does inspire them to want to continue uh, as, a, as a young musician. Um, and also we have our youth orchestra, which works with very talented young people. So our youth orchestra um, has d developed out of the, the Midlands Youth Orchestra. The CBSO took on the management for the orchestra 11 years ago now. Um, it's an orchestra of around 120, 130 young players. Um, we meet twice a year as, uh, as the large-scale um, symphonic orchestra and then we have a summer course with a slightly smaller, more chamber size orchestra. The whole process of the youth orchestra is about giving the children and the young people as much experience of what it is like to be in a professional orchestra, but with that additional coaching from our players. I think we also have a, a, very, um, a very specific focus on a creative conversation with young people. So a lot of the work we do in schools um, and in other community settings has to do with encouraging young people to compose music in their own right. Um, actually, we, we, we did a project in Brazil uh, last year with our collaborating composer in residence, John Barber, who specializes in devising, uh, devising um, music in collaboration with young people. So what he does in an ex uh, extraordinary way really is to unlock the creativity in a, a room full of young people and allow them to write their own music. Um, so that's been a big area of focus for us. E o projeto é, Laboratório de Regência, é, eu acho que ele caminha no sentido de diminuir um déficit que nós temos no Brasil. A maioria das escolas de música não possuem suas orquestras, portanto, muitos dos alunos de regência não tem, nunca regeram uma orquestra. Né? Então é feita também uma seleção, e isso inclui estudantes de música e profissionais, né? grandes profissionais já passaram por aqui, às vezes a gente assustava e aceitar está se, se candidatando. Então esses são 15 maestros, eles ficam aqui uma semana recebendo aulas do maestro Fábio Mequete, e quatro deles são escolhidos para reger a orquestra. Tá? Então são 11 que observam, que participam como alunos apenas, e quatro deles ativamente. Então no final da semana é, acontece um concerto com quatro peças e cada um dos quatro regentes regem a Orquestra Filarmônica de Minas Gerais dentro de um concerto oficial. Bom, nós temos é, as ações dentro do NGF, que é basicamente dar o mais alto é, formação possível dentro da área orquestral, dentro da área coral, dentro da área de linguagem musical, que abarca iniciação musical também. Temos atividades nos núcleos, essas atividades nos núcleos são as mais diversas possíveis. É, iniciação musical, iniciação orquestral, iniciação coral, uma orquestra de violões, é, e, e nos mais diversos núcleos possíveis também. O Coro Sinfônico da Orsi surgiu em 2002, justamente para montar a, a nona sinfonia de Beethoven, que, cujo quarto movimento demanda um coro. Só que um coro que passou por inúmeras transformações. É um coro totalmente amador, formado por amadores. E no, no melhor sentido dessa palavra, né? pessoas que gostam mesmo de, vir ensai, de, de cantar, de, de poder aprender a, a música. Então não deixa de ser um, 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 outro, uma outra, um braço de educação musical da Sinfônica do Sergipe também. Né? Ao mesmo tempo que aproveita esse lado da educação, e, 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 também utiliza o próprio coro para as apresenta apresentações sinfônicas. No CBSO, we have three choruses. Uh, we call them our symphonic choruses because the main purpose of them is to perform large-scale um, orchestral works with with our own orchestra although we do regularly work with other orchestras, both in the UK and abroad. Um, the CBSO Chorus is our adult chorus. We currently have around 200 members, and in 2015 we celebrated our 40th anniversary. Um, so they are all amateur singers drawn from across the region. Um, they are all auditioned, so we're able to maintain the standard, um, musically, the, the musical standard of, of the chorus. We also have a youth chorus, which is for girls only, aged 14 to 18. And we have a children's chorus for young people aged 7 to 14. So each of those choruses are also auditioned. Uh, we have around 85 children in each of those choruses. And again, they are able to explore repertoire which otherwise they would not have the opportunity to do. So we have a very long relationship with, with our singers. And we do have, I think there are about six members of the chorus, um, the adult chorus, 
who have been in it for 40 years. Um, they are very, very uh, committed and very dedicated. So we're very, very lucky to, to have such a, a professional group of choruses to work with. Um motto que a gente usa desde o início é um, um, um ditado latino lá e que foi traduzido em português, que é o Aprende Quem Ensina. Então nós acreditamos que essas pessoas, esses é, músicos da Juvenil, eles se transformam em monitores. E essa monitoria, é, eles recebem uma capacitação de, também de como ensinar, ou seja, o, desde rudimentos da didática até o mais alto possível na área de pedagogia musical. Então os meninos que estão tocando já estão se formando para irem no subúrbio, para irem é, em cidades distantes, para ensinar, para multiplicar, para é, pegar crianças pequenas e dar uma iniciação musical, colocar o violino na mão, colocar a flauta, ensinar a cantar. Our principal players are quite heavily involved in our Far Far Away series, for instance, um, and will take those projects on just as they take on any of our work. It's not, uh, it's not paid at a different rate, it's not, um, it's not treated as a sort of a different kind of product, it's, it's remunerated in that case just as we re remunerate a, uh, a standard chamber project at the South Bank or you know in any other context. Um, so we encourage, we like to encourage our principal players to be involved in that work. Obviously there are, there are times when they can't be and, and we, we, we have a, a pool of players who we draw on for that work just as we have a pool of players for other, other projects. Um, but certainly as an orchestra we like to involve our principal players as much as possible in that kind of work. Not all players are interested in delivering um, education community projects. We don't push people into doing it but the rates of pay are attractive, they're not derisory, so the, it financially um, it is desirable to do it, but some people feel more comfortable and others don't. And ultimately we, we of course have a professional orchestra which is a full-time job, so anybody who's doing education and community work, it's extra work that they're taking on, and as the schedule's already busy, you know, the, there's a choice. We have a lot of extra players that we can engage to do this work and we draw on those people to deliver the, the education program. I'd say 60% um, of the members are involved in education community work in some way but as I also said often the n number of um, projects they can do is limited by the schedule of their, you know, their, their main work. For me it's also a way of providing um, an additional creative output for our musicians. You know, for some of our players, they've been with the orchestra for maybe 30 or 40 years. And actually coming in to do a rehearsal, do a concert two, three times a week, it could become quite routine. And actually doing the work with young people or with the youth orchestra or mentoring um, conservatoire students, it provides them with that additional um, creative outlet and, and, and helps them um, broaden you know, their experience within the orchestra. There are a lot of musicians in the orchestra who are keen to do this type of work, but maybe don't feel they have the confidence or the skills to be able to really deliver to the high standard that, that they are used to as a player. So we're doing at the moment quite a lot of training and support and, and that's partly why the numbers involved in our education programme are going up. So I think that the key challenges other than, than the financial one, which everybody is in the same position, um, are around making sure we can fit in around the orchestra's schedule and, and making sure that we've got the right people with the right skills to, to do really high quality education work. The other thing that's important, of course, is that no organisation, uh, community or um, social or arts organisation can exist unless it's part of the community. And if you just sit there, back there and think, well, you know, we'll just give our concerts and they come or not, you don't, you don't really survive because you haven't integrated. You're, there's no reason for you being there if you're just isolated. I think orchestras can <clears throat> look very scary, that, you know, in their black and white suits and, and it's, it's in many ways it's quite an old-fashioned kind of way of presenting music so 
being able to take our players out um, to work alongside people, whether that's in the community or, or with children, um, just breaks down a lot of those barriers, makes us a lot more accessible and brings the music to life because for a lot of people, particularly in a city like Birmingham, which is incredibly diverse, it's a sound world, classical music is a sound world that people aren't familiar with. So the more we can do to infuse and excite and engage people with, with that sound world is, is absolutely essential. O quinto episódio da temporada Orquestras da série Gestão Cultural Mundo Afora foi dedicado aos programas educativos e às iniciativas de formação de músicos e corais. E qual o futuro das orquestras? Gestores de seis orquestras do Brasil e do Reino Unido apresentam algumas opiniões. The Orchestra of the Future, I, I suppose... Um for me and for the creative team that I work with, um, at the heart of what we do is playing great music really well. Um, that's, that's for us what, what we think drives audiences to come in and experience that magic of, of hearing an orchestra up close and hearing a, you know, a group of fantastically skilled players um, performing is, is, is always going to have an audience, we hope. And I think for us, it's all about um, how we can draw people into that experience and and so i don't i for, for us i don't i don't see that changing as the primary focus of what we of what we do you know it is easy to get very worked up about this issue and to say oh dear you know some concerts it's all old people there what's going to happen when they die nobody else will be coming but if you look back through history orchestras have been saying this for the last 150 years um it's only a problem if the next young people don't grow into uh, uh, old people who want to go to concerts and that's why the education program and the longer term audience development work that we do is so important. The issue is all about getting people into the hall for the first time. We know that when people come and experience the CBSO here in Symphony Hall, uh, you know, we, we, we play to a very, very high standard and people really love what we do. So uh, getting people in for the first time is a challenge. Where do you find them? Uh, and secondly, when they have been once or twice, it's persuading them that actually, instead of coming once a year, they should come twice a year. If we could persuade all the people who come once a year to come twice a year, and all the people who come twice a year to come three times a year, and so on. I think that it's um, interesting to use the technology to, to get our music to as many people as possible. Uh, but I think that ultimately the experience is in the concert hall. Um, as much as you might say that of, of um, a theatre production or an opera or a ballet, there's also always something very special about having the live experience. So I think that to a certain extent our challenge is, yes, to use the technology for distribution purposes, but the bigger challenge is how can we afford to keep doing what we do in a limited space with only a certain amount of seats, when all the time costs rise and all the time we know we cannot have efficiencies like other businesses because we are dependent on employing people. And uh, so we can't get those efficiencies within uh, the concert hall. Um, that, that is ultimately uh, the biggest challenge. There aren't many companies in the world that survive 83 years and uh, we're still here after 83 years. I mean, most, there aren't, literally there are not many companies. And arts organisations are some of the longest surviving companies. Um, and it's partly because they're used to living a precarious existence and that they move quite quickly, I think, in, in adapting to um, ways to make things work. So I'm quite ho hopeful. Então a gente tem que trabalhar na competência de execução. Nós também não podemos negar a, a verdade de uma orquestra sinfônica. Então vale a pena sim trabalhar os, re os grandes repertórios sinfônicos. Não adianta a orquestra é, negar todo, toda a sua tradição, todo o seu caminho e, e, e pensar em alterar completamente o repertório ou ser simplesmente orquestra de música popular, orquestra de, 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 de peças de pouca profundidade. Nós estamos indo para uma sociedade de muito pouca profundidade. Né? E a orquestra não pode ir por esse lado. Ela tem que manter 
é, aquele ideal de, da, da grande cultura e saber interligar com essas novas tecnologias. Eu acho que ela tem um futuro brilhante. Eu acho que a gente precisa construir só esses, esses novos paradigmas, não, não só de forma prática, mas também na cabeça dos gestores, na cabeça dos maestros e dos músicos. Mas nós temos é, muito o que fazer né, para que as orquestras no Brasil, é, para a evolução é, do, da, do setor orquestral no Brasil. Eu, é claro que fazer comparações é, são sempre na, ne, são realidades muito distantes, mas, na verdade, para um país, quando eu penso que o, os Estados Unidos têm 1.800 orquestras inscritas na Liga de Orquestras Americanas, né, 1.800 orquestras, e que nós aqui no Brasil tenhamos, não passemos de umas 30 orquestras no Brasil inteiro, eu penso que nós temos ainda um caminho muito grande a, a construir. Precisamos de muitas orquestras jovens, precisamos de academias, precisamos melhorar os conservatórios, porque isso aqui vão ser os celeiros né, para que a gente produza, para que nós tenhamos a possibilidade de ter um número muito grande de músicos, mas que esses músicos tenham para onde ir. E eles só terão para onde ir se nós tivermos orquestras jovens e orquestras profissionalizadas capazes de captar esses músicos. Então teremos, temos ainda um longo caminho, vamos é, acreditar que seja possível e dedicar muito esforço a essa construção. Eu ainda acredito, ainda não acredito muito que a prática musical ela é transformadora, ela é importante para o homem. Eu acredito que, para o ser humano, eu acredito que a orquestra, a prática orquestral é a maneira mais rápida e potente para inserir essa prática musical no cotidiano. Então, eu vejo na, um futuro da arte orquestral muito promissor. Agora, eu não posso lhe e garantir que o futuro das orquestras seja promissor, porque existem vários modelos. É possível que os modelos do século XX não, não durem muito mais, mas nós já, já sabemos que a, a, existe um bom número de orquestras no mundo que já acordaram para a necessidade de uma, de uma transformação, de uma ação mais abrangente da sua prática, é, de uma, uma penetração maior, é, seja no mundo da educação, simplesmente na sociedade, uma orquestra que esteja mais inserida no seu contexto, que esteja mais adaptada às realidades e não, não somente a reprodução de um modelo que funcionou num período áureo é, na Europa, num certo momento do século XX. É, eu acho que hoje nós estamos diante de, de várias possibilidades, de vários tipos de orquestra e saberemos em breve qual quais desses modelos vão, vão poder continuar para os próximos anos. Este foi o último episódio da temporada sobre gestão de orquestras. Ao longo de cinco episódios, debatemos infraestrutura, governança, sustentabilidade, programação artística e educação. E qual a sua opinião sobre o futuro das orquestras? Conte pra gente, deixe o seu comentário e participe deste diálogo sobre gestão cultural. E não esqueça de compartilhar o conteúdo nas suas redes sociais. Até a próxima!